but hey, how are you? if you're worried about the press, you know, if we can get away with it here, we prefer it here. Okay. But if he really wants there, we can, we got a spot where we can do it right away. Okay, I'm with State Rep Representative Jason Bartley from the 2nd District. That is uh, Bessel, Danbury, and Redding. Redding. I keep getting Redding and Sherman mixed up for some reason. Um, why don't you tell me about some of the things you're doing up there at the House? Uh, I saw that you worked very, very hard on getting the dropout bill through um, passed in the House. But why don't you tell me about the whole process in which um, you had to get that thing to the floor? Well, I think we could do a textbook... Uh, course on, on this particular bill because you know I introduced it we had a public hearing in education no one came to speak against the bill yet I couldn't get a vote in the education committee on this bill so what happened was I had to petition and it's the first time since 1993 that a Democrat has petitioned a bill and what that means is I get an automatic vote or a we as the people get an automatic vote on this particular bill raising the age for dropouts and I had to get 76 Democrats to agree with me that the process should move forward in terms of discussing the dropout age and the whole issue of dropouts in the state of Connecticut and uh, we did get our 76 votes we went back to the Education Committee they still prevented a vote and, you know, God bless them, but the chairs of education turned around and after that meeting and have worked with me uh, because what we did was we had the bill on the calendar, but we worked together and we got an amendment to another bill that is going to raise the age for dropouts to 17 in the state of Connecticut. It was a compromise. We were looking for 18. We went with 17. Uh, I'm going to come back next year. We're going to keep working to get it to 18. But right now, uh, we're very confident that in the state of Connecticut, you won't be able to withdraw from high school until you're 17 years old. It passed the House 130 to 16. And we expect good things to happen in the Senate and the governor to sign this bill. And the reason why it's so important now, uh, and all my friends on Hat City Block, is, you know what, there's a real correlation, there's a real cost-benefit to getting a diploma. If you don't get a diploma going forward, you'll only be able to earn $17,000. What is $17,000 in the state of Connecticut? You know, that ensures that we're going to be giving people food stamps, housing uh, supplemental uh, benefits to keep a house here. Um, we know that incarceration rates are through the roof. If you don't have a high school diploma, guess what? You have like a 50 to 60 percent probability that you're going to end up in one of these Connecticut prisons. So. There's a huge cost-benefit analysis. That's why we work so hard. That's why I petitioned the bill. Um, the achievement gap in the state of Connecticut is the largest in the nation, right here in our state. This will go towards addressing the achievement gap, because you know what? It's African Americans, Latinos, and urban whites that are not being educated in the state. And guess what? Those are the same folks that drop out of high school. So, I don't know. I just think that every kid, I don't care if you're a problem kid, I don't care if you've had some behavioral issues, every kid deserves a second chance. Every kid needs to get a high school diploma, and that's why I fought so hard for this bill. That's why I'll continue to fight for these issues, because I don't believe in giving up on teenagers. On some, on, on some level, we're raising all these standards to drive to get a license in the state of Connecticut, we got to send parents to uh, a course so they can, you know, become educated about their kids driving. But yet, we're doing easy permission slips and letting kids leave school with no thought, and that's unacceptable. So that's what the bill's been about. I appreciate uh, all the support I've gotten in uh, Greater Danbury on this bill, and all the support that I got in the House. We got 130 people to agree. We help. We got people to petition the bill out and. You know, I'm very uh, confident that we're going we're gonna to keep moving, uh, making great strides in this issue. Well, uh, yeah, as somebody from who was raised in the, in the greater Hartford area, I know very much about dropouts. I had a lot of friends who dropped out of Hartford Public High School, Weaver High School, Buckley, 
And uh, you're, you're right, dropping out of school is the wrong answer. And I know a lot of people can give, give testimony to that. So I, I thank you very much for that. Well, one of the things that I learned in this process that I wasn't really aware of was I met a lot of people who dropped out of high school that are adults now. And they are not your stereotypes. They're like hard working people. And they so regret the fact that they dropped out of high school. In fact, there is a lot of shame. And, and that shame, being ashamed of dropping out of high school really prevents us, prevents our brothers and sisters from moving forward. And we need to get rid of that. We need to eliminate the shame. We need to have more conversations with our young people and say, you know what, you have to do this if you want to survive in our society. If you want to be able to make the dollar to provide for your children and to be independent and to make something of yourself, you need to have a high school diploma, and that's that's really what it's all been about. Uh, one more quick thing, I, I want to I want to touch on Lyme disease for a second because I did follow you during your, your uh, interest in campaign, and uh, you brought up Lyme disease as one of your crusades. And I just want to find out how that's going um, in the Capitol right now. Where does that bill stand? Well, we're only waiting for the governor's signature at this point. It has been unanimous in the House and unanimous in the Senate. Uh, you mentioned in, in the, my last campaign, they say, Bartley, you couldn't get it done on Lyme disease. But you know what? We've been able to educate a lot of legislators, a lot of senators, uh, and quite frankly, I've sat down with the governor's staff, and I think we're going to have a bill. And basically, you know what? We're number one in the country in terms of the incidence of folks with Lyme disease. You can go out in your backyard right now and unfortunately come back into your house and actually get bit by a tick. And uh, you know, my good colleague, uh, hopefully he doesn't mind me mentioning this, but Representative Liddy, the day that it passed the Senate, was diagnosed with Lyme disease. He had a big rash in the back of his leg and he was in serious pain. And what this bill does is it guarantees Representative Liddy and every other person who uh, unfortunately finds himself diagnosed with Lyme disease, it, it, it guarantees that they may be able to get more than 30 days of antibiotics. And in the state of Connecticut, the Department of Health is biased towards doctors that will only prescribe one month of antibiotics. But if you get bit and you don't show evidence that you got bit and it stays in your system, hey folks, Lyme disease mimics syphilis. It affects your brain, it, it affects you know, all your joints, it is a deadly disease. And so, maybe more than 30 days is required. And unfortunately, there's two standards of care, and one set of doctors says you can only have 30 days, and another says, oh no, you may need more. And what this, this bill does, it is allows you to get more than 30 days of antibiotics. It guarantees medical access to doctors that are Lyme literate. And I'm very proud of my colleagues for voting for this and moving this bill forward, and I'm very confident the governor will sign it. Okay. Well, I'm sure the uh, first selectman of Bethel will send you a thank you note for all the hard work you're doing up here. Sure. <laughs> well, thank you very much for your time. I'll let you get back to the festivities, and uh, I appreciate you taking the time to talk to us today. I appreciate you uh, coming out here and talking about all these issues and keeping uh, the people informed. Thanks. All right. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm standing here with Senator McDonald. How's everything going here today? You know, this is a great opportunity for Democrats to come together, to rejuvenate, and to move the party forward. Uh, we've had some great victories over the last couple of years, but our, the best thing that we have tonight is energy that's going to propel us forward for 2010 uh, to make sure that Chris Dodd is re-elected uh, to the United States Senate, Jim Himes to the United States Congress, uh, and in my personal opinion, to elect Dan Malloy as the next governor of the state of Connecticut. Great. Well, let's talk about some stuff that's happening up at the state capitol right now. Number one, uh, the budget. I'm here, uh, from what I'm seeing there at the capitol, we have a situation where the Republicans are putting forth a budget that's at $8 billion. Uh, the Democrats have one that's at 8.7, and the, and the governor has one at 6, which is uh, it's wrong. Um, why can't the all parties involved just work with the same numbers from one one source, let's say OFA or OPM, 
And that's exactly what we've tried to do with the governor. The governor continues to resist uh, being truthful about the budget deficit that we face in the state of Connecticut. That's why we advanced legislation this session, which would require her to reconcile her numbers uh, with the nonpartisan uh, Office of Fiscal Analysis. Uh, we put that on her desk. We're going to hopefully override any veto that she has of that legislation. But the bigger issue is that we have to acknowledge the full scope of the problem we have. We can't move Connecticut forward. We can't dig ourselves out of this hole until we actually acknowledge how big the hole is. Like, I, I can't understand why the, uh, the Republicans, for instance, would say they have a no tax increase budget when it's based off of eight billion. You still have like seven hundred million. You still have to make up. So it doesn't seem like that they're being quite honest in terms of the real impact of this budget. I don't think that they are moving the the, the debate forward. The, the reality is, even with the governor's most recent uh, budget proposal, she's borrowing basically $2 billion and securitizing other assets of the state of Connecticut. That's not helping the debate. That's not moving us forward. The fact of the matter is that we've got a problem. We all have to share in that problem. There are going to be very painful cuts, uh, but we're going to also have to address revenues. There's no doubt about it. Uh, and at, at the end of the day, she's going to actually have to come to the table and acknowledge the full scope and breadth of the problem. I want to change it to another topic real fast. I know the death penalty uh, abolishment just came forward. It was just passed in both chambers. Do you think the governor should sign the bill? Oh, there's no doubt. There's no doubt. There's no fact. There's no doubt that the death penalty is not a deterrent to crime. Uh, we know that it's uh, racially disparate in its in its implementation, and the fact is that uh, that it's really not helpful to the victims and their families. The families of these uh, victims go through decades of, of court hearings that are not never going to come to a closure. We need to send these heinous criminals to prison with life in prison without possibility of release uh, to bring finality to this. And the fact is that the governor needs to listen to the, the Catholic bishops and the other people of faith in, in the state of Connecticut who want to abolish the uh, death penalty to join 15 other states who have abolished it. Uh, and to move our state forward, not to measure ourselves by the standards of Texas or Louisiana or th many third world nations. Well, I won't hold you up. I know the festivities are getting started. Thank you very much for taking time to talk to the My Left Nutmeg community, and I hope to hear from you again soon. Oh, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. You know, in Washington, D.C., they, they debate big issues. And of course, over the last few years, one of the issues they've talked about is immigration. And I'm probably going to take a position that's not popular with everybody, but I'm just going to kind of tell you a story. You know, for those of you who are history buffs, you know that we kind of have a rise and an ebb and a flow of this immigration from time to time. In fact, during the last century, 1860 through about 1895, there was a political party called the Know Nothing Party. You ever heard about them? Know Nothing Party? They, uh, they actually had members of Congress, ran people for president. They were dedicated to keeping this country pure. Now they knew that there were going to be people coming from Europe, new immigrants, but they, they just wanted to make sure that those immigrants that came were, well, you know, white and Protestant. They didn't want a bunch of, uh, you know, Jews and Catholics and other folks showing up. By the turn of the century, they'd kind of evolved into the KKK, true story, political party. And, uh, but, you know, around the turn of the century out west, they increased the ability to homestead from 160 to 320 acres. And so a large number of European immigrants were coming to the west to find their piece of land. And around that time, we were allowing people to come from Europe in unlimited numbers. If you were European and Protestant, all you had to do was apply and you could get on the boat and be an American. But if you were Catholic, read Irish or Italian, if you were Jewish, it was a lottery system. Now I'm going to tell you a story about Mary Beth Friel from County Donegal in Ireland. She was one of those very lucky people, and her number was drawn. And Mary Beth, 19 years old, said goodbye to all of her family and friends, because when you left Ireland in those days, you knew you would never see your family, you would never see your friends again, but you, you would have that opportunity to come to America. Now just two weeks before Mary Beth got on that boat, a young man proposed marriage and she decided to stay. 
but her younger sister, Hannah Friel. She said, I'll be damned if I'm going to let that paperwork go to waste. So she illegally took her sister's passport and all of her paperwork and she got on that boat and she courageously rode that boat to Ellis Island, an illegal, illegal immigrant. She stood in line, her hands were shaking as she walked to the front and presented her papers and they looked at her, they looked at the passport, freckles, red hair, I'll get in, another Mick. And then, during a two-week period, she nearly starved to death in New York City. The sign said, help wanted. Jews and Irish need not apply. She ate out of dumpsters. Some Irish immigrants actually gave her some lodgings and some food, but they were poor as well. And then, then she heard about a man who had built a private railroad from Minneapolis to Seattle. And this man, Jim Hill, needed people to homestead in a place called Montana. So she got on that boxcar. Now, she grew up on a farm in Donegal and she thought it'd be better to starve on a farm than to starve in the streets of New York City. So she got on a boxcar. She rode it all the way to the prairie of Montana. She got off of that train and she walked 17 miles and staked out her claim to 320 acres of prairie. She planted wheat on that farm, 17 years old, an illegal immigrant, and later after she proved her homestead up and owned that land, she married another Irish immigrant, and between the two of them, they raised a family of five on the prairie in Montana. Now I've been here and out of Washington, D.C. Last year they were saying, if you arrived here illegally, remember that? If you arrived here illegally, even if you're a good citizen, even if you've been paying your taxes, you got to go back to wherever you came from and wait in line until it's your time to come here legally. On that basis, you would send the governor of Montana back to County Donegal in Ireland, Hannah Montana Friel was my grandmother. And by the way, how many, how many of you came here with crowns on your head? What kind of paperwork do you think your grandparents and great-grandparents have? It is that story and 10 million more like it that make this the greatest country on the planet. Um, why don't you tell me a little bit how you feel about the Credit Card Act getting passed? I know you worked very hard on that legislation, and um, for the people who might not know everything about that particular bill, can you describe what it's all about and how it, it will um, actually help us out in terms of uh, keeping the credit guys off of us? Off our well, you remember we had a good conversation about this a few weeks ago, and the one issue that people wanted to make sure we would not retreat on, I forget which one of you asked me the question, and that is whether or not they'd be retroactively be able to go back and raise interest rates on previous balances. And, and we kept that promise. That is in that bill. The one regret I have is it, it doesn't become a, a, effective tomorrow. Uh, in order to get the votes, we had to delay the implementation of the bill until early next year, uh, around January, February. So uh, that is there. You got to wait. You can't, you can't, you know, eliminate someone. Or on fees for 45 days, you get 21 days to respond. Uh, they can't uh, just have your your money you pay pay the lower interest rate that's due, but rather has to go to the higher interest rate. Uh, you get to decide whether or not you want a credit limit. You get to decide to opt out. It empowers you as a consumer in this country, not the issuing companies, to decide what the limitations will be. So those are I mean there are many more the double cycle billing, the the universal default stuff which. Uh, allowed them to continue to charge you interest rates on the total amount that was due, not just the part left after you paid it off. So, I mean, those are the major things, although there's a lot more to it. It's a major landmark piece of legislation, and it's the first time the Congress has ever sat there and overturned the credit card industry. So, I only got it out of my committee by a one-vote margin, but I got 90 votes on the floor of the Senate with the bill. So it shows you what can happen when you get out the floor. People didn't want to vote against me on that bill. Um, what are we going to be doing in terms of health care in the country? Is that something you're going to be tackling? You bet. Start tomorrow. I'm going to have the tobacco bill up tomorrow. We have three to 4,000 kids every day that start smoking. Uh, we lose 400,000 people a year because of smoking-related illnesses. 
and, and by putting some real teeth in the FDA and prohibiting the kind of sales to younger people, that's the first real step in the health care bill, preventive medicine, uh, b preventive policies. And then, of course, we're going to start immediately with this very large bill in hopes to complete it in the next 12 weeks. And believe me, the, the blogosphere really needs to get involved in this debate. They admit you were a great help on credit cards. You were a great help on the housing uh, foreclosure mitigation. You were a great help when it came uh, to the FISA courts and the wiretapping that went on. Now I really need you on health care. If we're going to succeed here, the other side is going to try to kill this bill. And health care changes everything. It'll be the single most important bill that most members of Congress will ever vote on because it alters fundamentally how people have access to health care, which ought to be a right and not a privilege. Um, one more quick thing uh, for me. Um, we, uh, Barack Obama, President Obama, has put forth a Supreme Court nominee that the uh, headline of the Prescott uh, Bush uh, tour on Thursday called a racist. Um, what are your feelings on, on the, the, the nominee, and do you think she will be uh, confirmed? I, I, I don't know her. Others know her far better, and, and I'll be watching. Obviously, I think she's a great choice based on everything I've seen so far. Uh, but, but I'll have a vote on it, so I, I, my, my, I always, before I announce a vote, I always like to do my homework. And so while I'm, I'm very favorably inclined towards her, I tell the audience today, but I've always, you know, my job is to patiently listen. She'll have that confirmation hearing. Uh, I think some of the comments I've heard about her from Dick Cheney and from Newt Gingrich have been outrageous, in my view. But nonetheless, I, I'm going to let the committee do its job, but I'm very excited about uh, this nominee. I think she has an opportunity to be, uh, again, a game changer on the Supreme Court. And uh, so I'm hopeful, she, I'm hopeful that she'll be confirmed, and I hope to be a vote for her. But I need to reserve that final judgment until I've actually done the homework. How do you feel about the Governor Rell and this whole budget situation that's going on here? As she puts forth a budget that's $6 billion, it's $2 billion short, and we have a lot of infighting between the de uh, Democrats and Republicans in the Governor's office. And what's your feeling on this? I think it's, it's a real failed leadership that she has demonstrated, and uh, I always have felt that she was a reactionary governor, and what she does is reacts to what the press is pushing and whatever seems to be a popular issue. But the fact that on February 4th, she presented a budget that was $2 billion short of what it should have been is abominable. And I just can't believe that she continues to put forth a budget that does not balance and it is not meeting the needs of the people. And what is she doing in this last budget? She's taking away jobs. She's taking away eyeglasses for poor children. I mean, the things that she is doing just so she can say she's not raising taxes is unconscionable. I mean, I, I'm just speechless about what she continues to do and that she's not being called on it by this, the media all over the place, that they are letting her get away with uh, what she is doing. And the fact that in the legislative body, you have Republicans stalling and they're filibustering on every bill not to let things go through and so that their bills could come up. And these are very difficult times for so many people. People are losing their homes, their jobs, they don't have health care. And you have the Republicans filibustering and the governor is not responding to the needs of the people. So it's just frustrating for me. Now, um, on, on another topic that is dear to a lot of people, um, do you feel that the, the governor should sign the, 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 um, the bill abolishing the death penalty? Yes, I do. I happen to be one of those people who feels that this is wrong for us to be killing people. I do believe that you can give people a lifetime in prison, uh, 23 hours in solitary confinement. There's all different ways that people could be punished, but to be uh, actually killing people I think is absolutely wrong and I think it tends to um, also hurt people who have been put in jail because they weren't able to afford good lawyers like so many are and that it tends to favor people who have money and I do believe that it should not be there. Now, um, the, the, new, the latest Q polls just came out. It showed that the governor still has a high approval rating, although, we, we, you know, on one side she's got a high approval rating, but on the other side she's really not doing a hell of a lot. Um, what does the Connecticut Democrats have to do in terms of getting the message out there about the problems with the governor across to the public? 
Well, I think we have to do it in a grassroots effort because clearly people don't understand um, what is happening. And I think it's unfortunate that uh, people just see her as a nice person. But if you were to ask these people, because I often do, I'll say to them, you know, when they say they like the governor, I'll say, well, what has she done? And nobody can give me one thing that she has done that proved beneficial to people. So I think we have to continue to get that message across and we have to talk one-on-one -on -one and have it expand that way in order to get people to start thinking about well she might be a nice person but right now in this budget process she isn't being a nice person and we have to start holding her accountable well thank you very much for your time I do appreciate it okay thank you